What is up guys? Welcome back to a brand new reaction and welcome to day number, hold on. Oh, it was already on the right day. Day number five of reactions. Not gonna lie, I didn't know if I was gonna be able to get a video out for today. Cause I got a bad tooth back here and last night it started hurting so bad I couldn't even talk. But then I went to the dentist today, got some medicine and stuff like that. I gotta go back in like two weeks. So if my words are a little bit harder to understand today, that's why. <laughs> but today we're watching the history of England summarized. Y'all know one of my favorite things about the UK is the history of the UK. There's so much of it. And I feel like every time we do a history reaction, I learn like a hundred new things. So we are here to learn today. So we're about to get into it. Going to channel hit the subscribe button drop a like for reactmas and drop a like if you want to see us do more history reactions but other than that let's get into it also the hood is going on because it is 21 degrees fahrenheit yeah and i can't run the heater because it's too loud for the camera so my lips start turning purple somebody tell me <laughs> names are hard especially when it comes to the british isles the island of britain is home to england scotland and wales while the island of ireland is composed of the republic of ireland and the united kingdom's northern ireland this is not only a nightmare to keep track of but as we've seen this is all subject to change probably a little sooner than we think i say all this to clarify what we're actually going to be talking about in this video England. Now, not only is England not Britain, but its history is plenty interesting all its own. So, see, that's one thing I take I take pride in, is that I actually know like the difference between the United Kingdom, the British Isles, England, Wales, Scotland. Like, I learned that pretty early on, like doing all these reactions and learning about the UK. So I take pride in that. I'm happy that I actually know that. <laughs> To see how England grew from a simple Roman province to the master of Britain and a major world power, let's yeah. do some history. Our earliest documentation for England comes with the arrival of Julius Cheekbones Caesar, who crossed over from Gaul in 55 BC. The native Cheekbone. Celts were none too pleased with their new neighbors, so Rome kind of stalled for a century until Emperor Claudius established the province of Britannia. Roman influence on the island was rather slim outside of the main port cities. Since it was hard enough to schlep all those armies across the channel, they were happy to delegate certain responsibilities to the local local kings. In 60 AD, one such client king bequeathed half of his lands to Rome, but when the empire glommed all of it anyway, the late king's wife Boudicca led a rebellion that burned through several eastern cities, including Londinium. Before hey, his wife led the rebellion? Dang, that's a bad chick right there. But I'd like to take a second just to like comprehend that we're talking about 60 AD right now. <laughs> I'm gonna be honest, I don't even know when in time that was. <laughs> It was so long ago, they still had letters in the year, so like... <laughs> That's ridiculous. She was defeated in battle. Later, Romans expanded outwards to the edge of Caledonia before Hadrian said nope and built a wall across the island to stop any hotshot general from getting ideas. The benefit of Britannia's insulation was that it didn't see much disruption from the carousel of imperial civil wars. But the downside was that Britannia was the first province to be cut loose when the barbarians started rolling up in the 400s. The next several centuries are marked by a constant shuffling between small Romano-Britannic kingdoms and a tidal wave of Northern European newcomers. The polite term for this is disorganized, and the accurate term for this is gross. The early medieval period saw raids and migrations from Picts, Angles, Jutes, and Saxons, and while the map doesn't stop fidgeting with its borders anytime soon, the players get a little clearer by the late 600s. Here we can see seven major Anglisk and Saxon kingdoms of Northumbria, Kent, East Anglia, Mercia, Essex, Sussex, and Wessex. Those last three being East, South, and West Saxony, in case you were wondering why England sexed up so many of its place names. These kingdoms That makes sense though, like... Why I keep changing the name? Just make it North, South, East, and West. <laughs> and then put a sex on the end of it. <laughs> Entirely Britannic, nor fully Germanic. Just like the Romans, it was a case of gradual integration between lots of small and unique groups of people. Sometimes friendly, sometimes stabby. For a dash of literary context, the legendary character of King Arthur is set specifically against the backdrop of these Germanic migrations. Historically speaking, our record gets a little clearer in the Christian monasteries of Northumbria, where the scholar Bede wrote the Ecclesiastical History of England, our best source for this period. And Jeez. monasteries all across Northumbria were becoming magnificent palaces of literature and art throughout the 600s and 700s. Bro, the fact that we were building stuff like that... Can have a little magnific like, magnificent palaces all the way back then, we, were, we could create a structure that looks like that. That's impressive. To me, like, bro, you gave me all these bricks and told me to build, like, a square. Couldn't do it. Couldn't do it. <laughs> so the fact that they were doing all this with, like, with, like, the old age tools and knowledge that they had back then, bro, that's so crazy. Literature and art throughout the 6 and 700s. Northumbria can have a little bit of a golden age as a treat. 
The good news is that this was really shiny, but the bad news is that maybe this was a little bit too shiny, as the glittering attracted our old pals the Vikings, who rolled up to the island monastery of Lindisfarne to save the priceless relics from the totally unrelated fires that started burning right as the Vikings arrived. Huh? Weird. From there, the Vikings kept on coming, raiding all up and down the coasts and even heading inland with the great heathen army. Bro, this was we are talking Vikings right now. Dude, that's so cool. I know a lot of like what the Vikings did wasn't too cool, but Vikings are cool. Just like the thought of them like... Especially bad news for the King of Wessex, who was partway through conquering Mercia when the Scandinavians glomped their way down the eastern coast. They didn't have the means or the interest to form a single unified state, but the laws of these incoming Danes held sway over a pretty beefy stretch of land. So we call this thingy the Dane Law because when historians aren't creative, they're at least direct. True. While the Dane Law became a shiny mercantile midpoint between Ireland and Scandinavia, it was soon reverso glomped by the Kingdom of Wessex. By 927, King Ethelstan had conquered all the way to Northumbria and began to style himself as King of England. So now, finally, we can actually discuss England as a single state. In the it sense took fall that long and that many different people to fight over and battle over and it changed hands of possession so many times like almost like what eight nine hundred years later now it's finally england that just shows like the amount of history that's in the uk that is so crazy Following, Northumbria played hopscotch between English and Viking rule, and some wacky royal gymnastics resulted in the Scandinavian Canute becoming king of England, Denmark, and Norway for two decades. But Dang. despite the near constant tire fire of Scandinavian invasions and an extremely squiggly royal lineage, England had become impressively well run for the time as the governing bureaucracy was organized and they knew how taxes worked. Not bad. Good job. Good job. Now, where I live, I guess we didn't like that idea too much a couple hundred years later, but... <laughs> But, as will become a running theme in the next few centuries, there's no getting over that pesky question of royal succession. After the death of King Edward in 1066, the crown passed to Harold Godwinston, but two other parties wanted that shiny headwear for themselves, namely King Harold Hardrada of Norway and Duke William of Normandy. Hardrada arrived to challenge Godwinson for the title of one true herald, but was beaten at the Battle of Stamford Bridge. However, Godwinson's luck ran out one month later when... <laughs> And that's the Norman Conquest in a nutshell. In Dang. contrast to the other assorted cases of England being conquered, this one had lasting significance. Firstly, William was set on keeping his hot new kingdom, so he invented this little doohickey called a castle and built him all over England to protect his armies from the odd revolt. Meanwhile- Wait a minute. This man created castles? <laughs> no, that's dope. <laughs> that is crazy. He built the first castles in the UK. Wow. I also like how like throughout the entire history of the United Kingdom, whoever was in charge, their names were either Edward, George, William, Henry, then throw in a couple like Queen Elizabeth here and there. Like, there was like seven or eight names that just everybody that ruled the UK just siphoned through. <laughs> He replaced the English aristocracy with freshly imported Norman barons. Now, the Normans, being from France, were French, so they Bonjour. spoke their native language instead of the local Old English. Over the centuries, these two languages smushed into each other to create what we recognize as English, our beautiful disaster of a language. What? The last significant consequence was that William was still Duke of Normandy, and his supervisor, the King of France, was a little miffed that he went and yoinked himself a kingdom. Wait a minute, so we got English from, like, Old English and French combining the two. I did not know that. That's cool. And then a couple hundred years later, we, you know, we left. We came over here to America. And throughout our time, we took what was created, the English language, and we, like, rubbed it in the dirt. And then that's what we speak. <laughs> And this diplomatic hiccup would embroil England and France in a casual 600-year-long rivalry. Now, this is Jeez. normally the point where English history slavishly trails along the royal family tree through all its twists and turns, but this You know, I didn't mention James or Charles's. Yeah, there's a lot of them, too. <laughs> ...is a summary, and I don't care about kings. Royal gymnastics are far too dull to be this needlessly confusing. I say this now so we can skip the faff later on. Yeah. What matters to us here in the middle 1100s is that the royal family married across the channel, so now the King of England became the Duke of Normandy, the Count of Anjou, and the Duke of Aquitaine. Dang. England has never been taller. This Angevin period rewrites Anglo-Frankish relations to the tune of You Got Chocolate in My Peanut Butter. Anywho, with this absurdly large tax base and access to half a France load of natural resources up and down the Atlantic coast, the Angevin Empire was an economic powerhouse. 
Of course, money means rich people, and rich people means armed robberies, so this period <laughs> is the main historical setting for the legends of Robin Hood, most closely associated with the reign of the crusading King Richard the Lionheart at the turn of the 13th century. Speaking of Bro. military stuff, England took this opportunity to hop westward and glomp onto the Dublin-y part of Ireland. They tried for more, but they didn't really get much else. Conquest is all well and good, but it's also expensive, and France was itching to get the rest of its France back, so the early 1200s saw Normandy, Anjou, and most of Aquitaine go poof. Meanwhile, so Basically, back then, it was like, if you have enough money, you can just, like, take over these places. ...set up with the monarchy, that makes two of us, so they forced a few kings to sign a contract recognizing that teamwork makes the dream work. As in, the Magna Carta makes kings consult their barons, and this puts us on track to get Parliament a ways down the line. Wow. Elsewhere in Britain, King Edward Longshanks conquered the Kingdom of Wales and glomped onto Scotland for a hot second, but they broke free. The problem for England was that Scotland had allied with France, and by the mid-1300s, France was in a century-long win streak. King Edward III was a big fan of the part where England owned half of France, so he went for broke and claimed a right to the French kingship to justify a continental invasion. A bold strategy. It won't work. But it took a century for that to become apparent. From 1337 to 1453, England and France were locked in a hundred years war. Edward oh. oversaw the first act, where the English poured across the channel and thrashed the French army at the Battle of Cressy. To explain why, we've got to dig into the real juicy stuff. Economics. <sighs> All right, look, I minored in econ. I have to at least pretend like this was worth something, okay? It all comes down to how they collected taxes. England had the sophistication to tax money and put it towards a professional army, while France took payment in goods and conscription, so their army was bigger, sure, but far weaker. Huh. England's advance would have pressed on were it not for the surprise guest appearance of plague. Soon after the fighting <laughs> resumed, the new French king, Charles V, had a much better time than his predecessor and pushed the English out to the edges of Gascony and Calais. The third phase of the war is the spicy stuff that shows up in all those Shakespeare plays. We're talking Battle of Agincourt, Henry V, Hella Longbows, take that, Frenchies! <clears throat> After the loss, France fell into a civil war and almost collapsed until Joan Kick-Ass d'Arc arrived to absolutely steamroll the English. Bro, King Henry Joan d'Arc was, like, that story is so crazy. VI had exactly zero ways to handle this, so England got swept right on out of there. By 1453, all they had left was a tiny little sliver of Calais. Despite the war's overt goal of conquer France, it inadvertently cemented a distinct English identity through language, national heroes, and insular geography. The other major consequence was Big Shot another succession crisis. I've covered the War of the Roses before, and I respect you too much to bore you with this. All that matters is that a king died, and two families spent a century stabbing each other over who would get the crown. Jeez. Long twist, both of them. Big ups to Henry VII for marrying the houses of York and Lancaster together to create the Tudor dynasty and resolve that mess for good. See, the that's Tudors a whole nother history. Like, the history and, like, the tree of the royal family. I'm pretty sure this same channel has, like, a summarized royal family tree. If y'all want to see that reaction, we'll do it. Because, like, I know a little bit, but nowhere near. Like, when it goes back to, like, all of them, I have zero clue. So if y'all want to see that reaction, let me know managed to accomplish quite a bit in their century-long runtime. The first order of business for King Henry VIII was to formalize the rules for royal succession, presumably because he had to read about the War of the Roses and decided never again. But he also had outside problems, as King Charles of Spain and the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V, coincidentally the same Charlie, was getting a smidge overpowered since he put the Pope under house arrest. Bro, for everybody's damn name was Charles back then, <laughs> like... Another complicating matters was the little fact that Henry's first wife was also Charles' aunt, and she wasn't bearing any male heirs. Henry deftly solved the three problems of Charles, the Pope, and his wife. I want to get rid of my wife, but only the Pope can annul the marriage, and Charles locked him in a box. <laughs> what was going on back then? <laughs> Unmoved by going diet Protestant and forming his own church. This new Church of England didn't really lean that hard into Protestant theology, but the real swerve was that the church answered only to the king. This quasi-reformist compromise wasn't exactly the easiest thing in the world to enforce, but the Tudors made it work. Meanwhile, back in geopolitics land, Henry made a new push into Ireland, and tried and failed to bully Scotland into uniting with England. So wait, he created the Catholic religion? Is that what he, is that what he said? Hang on, let's go back. 
overpowered since he put the Pope under house arrest. Further complicating matters was the little fact that Henry's first wife was also Charles' aunt. See, he's got a little Kentucky in him right there. Char yeah, wife, aunt, yeah. <laughs> he wasn't bearing any male heirs. Henry deftly solved the three problems of Charles, the Pope, and his wife in one move by going diet Protestant and forming his own church. This new Church of England didn't really lean that hard into Protestant theology, but the real swerve was that the church answered only to the king. Huh. This quasi-reformist compromise wasn't exactly Catholics the... believed that breaking with Rome was far too radical, while hardcore reformists thought Henry didn't go far enough. Okay, so it wasn't, he, it wasn't Catholics, okay. Easiest thing in the world to enforce, but the Tudors made it work. Meanwhile, back in geopolitics land, Henry made a new push into Ireland, and tried and failed to bully Scotland into uniting with England. <laughs> in the second half of the century... Hey, Scotland held their ground for a long time. They're like, no, we ain't having it, no. <laughs> Elizabeth I held the fort against an increasingly aggressive Spain, way too hyped on conquistador cash to remember what hubris means. In 1588, Spain hucked an armada at England in the hopes of conquering it, but English cannons and English weather smashed the fleet to bits. When Elizabeth died without an heir, the crown passed to her nearest male relative, who happens to be King James VI of Scotland. So in 1603, James became King of Scotland and England. Everything after the Union of the Crowns is the Britain plotline, where they glomp all the isles, make an empire, all that rule Britannia jazz. So this is where we'll wrap our history of England. And wow. I'll be fully honest, sagas like this give history a bad rap. So the not like... The entire United Kingdom came together because the first Queen Elizabeth didn't have anybody to pass it on to. So the next best person was the King of Scotland, so that's when it all came together. Bro! What? Lance, it's a 1,600-year-long nightmare that's stuffed with more monarchs than anybody should be forced to remember. Sure. And it's easy to get bogged down in any one episode or to lose track entirely. But the good news is that just because English historians are sadistically meticulous and blindingly self-obsessed doesn't mean that we have to be. Because if we zoom out a little bit and focus on England as a unit rather than a backdrop for royal gymnastics, the important kings will make sense in context and we avoid getting bogged down in the details. Yeah. So then we can clearly see the macro plot progression from Roman province, through the Haptarchy, into the conflicts with France, and out towards the formation of Britain. Wow. So let English history show why the big picture is often the clearest, and also serve as an object lesson in the historiographic benefits of restraint. Dude. Thank you so much for watching. That was impressive. That video had so much information. More monarchs than anyone should be forced to remember. Me thinking about learning all the names from the Kings and Queens song from Horrible Histories. We need to do some horrible history reactions. I've seen a lot of people suggest that, and I, and I don't think we've ever done one. So if y'all want to see us react to some horrible histories, let me know. Apparently they have a Kings and Queens song, so hey, we could just learn all the names. <laughs> but alright guys, that is going to do it for the history of England. Y'all let me know what y'all thought down in the comments. If y'all want to see more history reactions like this one, let me know by hitting that like button. Thank you guys so much for watching. Day number five of Reactness. 20 more days to go, baby. 20 more days of Christmas. Hopefully the toothache calms down a little bit and we're good to go. Thank you guys so much for watching. Make sure you go today. Spread love, spread kindness. Do something nice for my day. I love you guys so much. I really do. Shit, you're I'm out. Peace.